good morning. I'm Lynette Zelesny, President, California State University, Bakersfield, and I wish you a very warm welcome to our beautiful campus here in Bakersfield. Today is a very special event. We are so privileged to have all of you that are joining us on our campus. And I want to thank the sponsors of this morning's event, Kern Schools Federal Credit Union, Adventist Health Bakersfield and Kaiser Permanente, the Kegley family, the Valley Public Radio, California State University Bakersfield, Office of the Provost and University Advancement. And I do want to give a very special thank you to my friends, Drs. Nina and Ravi Patel and the entire committee who has worked tirelessly on Gandhi's 150th anniversary of his birthday. Thank you very much. And this is a dream morning for me. Not only do we have the opportunity to welcome some very special guests, the grandson of Gandhi, Arun Gandhi, and Apun Mehta from Service Services, and we are so happy to welcome also the grandson of Cesar Chavez, who had, of course, a great relationship in the teachings of Gandhi. And so we have here with us today two grandsons of two greats, and they are here with us in the front row. So what an amazing day. So we're very honored. Thank you to uh, both of our speakers today. We're very honored to welcome you to our community, which is a very loving community, and we welcome you again to this beautiful campus. It is truly inspiring to see so many of you here today and to see so many families. We're so happy to have the young, the young people that will be learning about servant leadership and nonviolence here with us today, and we're honored to learn more about Gandhi's powerful message of peace and nonviolence. Your presence here demonstrates our community's true investment and true value of diversity as a strength. Celebrating the 150th anniversary of his birth, Gandhi is still helping to make the world a better place. He's our touchstone. As I look out at all of you, it is clear that his spirit remains very alive through the people like you who are dedicated to living his ideals and celebrating the dignity of all human beings. Challenging times today more than ever, we must all recommit ourselves to those ideals. And as a scholar in psychology of nonviolence and the teachings of Gandhi, and also as a traveler in India. We must remember, in the words of Gandhi, that nonviolence is not a garment to be put on and off at will. It must be an inseparable part of our being. I thank you, and I look forward to an amazing morning with you. Thank you very much. Thank you all, I've got about a 45 minute speech, so just take a deep breath and be ready. So, uh, you know, it's exciting and beautiful to see that the hall is filled up with uh, people who really are inspired by Mahatma Gandhi. You know, he had no title, no position, and yet he transformed the entire world in some way, shape or form. And, uh, one of the beautiful things is that uh, some time ago, uh, I took my two boys, Rishi and Amar. Of course, I'm always trying to convince them to become like Gandhi, but it's a struggle, you know. <laughs> so I took them with me to South Africa, where I was born, and I took them to Soweto, uh, just to see that two people who won the Nobel Prize lived on the same street. There's no other place in the world like that and both of them were inspired by Mahatma Gandhi, Desmond Tutu and Nelson Mandela. 
both of them living on the same street in Soweto. Just amazing what Mahatma Gandhi has done to the world, you know. Uh, of course, uh, CSUB and uh, the Gandhi Committee did a variety of things to promote uh, the beautiful, beautiful uh, memory and legacy of Mahatma Gandhi. Uh, throughout the year, uh, a variety of events were planned. There was uh, the movie. Of course, it's become world famous and uh, won many awards. Following that, there was the interfaith conference, uh, and then there was a musical evening, and then, of course, uh, you know, CSUB allowed us to do the peaceful march, and uh, we have to thank again Dr. Zalesny and uh, also Dr. Michael Burroughs, who has been doing so much work. He's been struggling up and down and getting nervous, sweating, doing a variety of things, but finally he's made it happen, you know, so we're happy about that. And then uh, I also want to say that, you know, uh, Bakersfield College, it's a collaborative community. We have a great community, we work together. Of course, we have to fight also periodically, but we still work together, you know. So, uh, but at the end of the day, we're all connected. And uh, like, uh, there is a very famous uh, Hindu saying, it goes to say that Vasudeva Kutumbakam, the whole world is my family. We've got to fight with our brother and sister, but at the end of the day, we're connected, you know. And uh, we have to remember that that was Gandhiji's principle. So uh, we thank uh, a variety of people for doing what they did. But years ago, one important person here, I don't know whether she's here, I hope she's here, Hansa Ben Patel started, uh, I have glasses. So 25 years ago, this lady ran into me in the doctor's lounge at one of the hospitals and gave me this long talk on Gandhi. And I said, you know, look, I got a lot. In my mind, I was thinking I got, I got to sign all these charts and get out of here. And then at the, at the end of the conversation, I was quite touched by the fact that, you know, she really was connected to Mahatma Gandhi and started one of the first interfaith con uh, conferences in this community. And that has been uh, going on now for the last 25 years. And thanks to her for inspiring that. <laughs> uh, I also uh, wanted to thank uh, Dr. Uh, Sudab and Bhatt, who also has spent a lot of time for this particular event. So thank you so much. Um, <laughs> And then I uh, have a long list of people, but I can't forget Steve. Steve Flores lumbers along and always helping people all the time. But, you know, we're happy for uh, having him. And uh, uh, before I finish, I did want to mention one other thing, and that is that uh, we can't forget the community. The community is what supports this event. So we have a beautiful community, I mentioned that in the beginning, and we're very grateful for what they did. Uh, and then I did want to mention, of course, Dr. Michael Burroughs is gonna introduce uh, uh, Arun Gandhi and uh, Nipun Mehta. But I do want to say that, you know, I'm not related to Arun Gandhi, but uh, we do share one thing in common, and that is that we were both born in the same country. He was born in South Africa in a place called Durban. I was born in a place called Fordsburg, Johannesburg. And that's where Mahatma Gandhi began his first, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, unrest and, uh, and expressions of uh, working for the benefit of all of the human rights. And that's where he, there's the famous saying that he went there as Gandhi, and then when he left, he returned as a Mahatma Gandhi to India. So uh, we share that common thing with uh, Arun Gandhi, so uh, we're excited about that. We're also very excited about our second speaker, Nipun Mehta. This guy is the real deal also, you know, and uh, it's just amazing how much, uh, I, I think his life is a living expression of what you need to do 
when the rubber meets the road to live the right way. You know, he doesn't only preach it, he does it. So uh, we thank him for coming here and joining us. And then I do know that if I do not thank my wife, I'll be beaten up. So <laughs> I, I love my wife. She's a beautiful lady. And uh, she's done an amazing, she has put in a lot of effort in this. Uh, I've skipped a lot of evening dinners and quite a few breakfasts, but that's okay. She is cool and we love her. Thank you. Thank you, President Zelezny and Dr. Patel, for your welcoming comments and uh, for your support for this event, uh, which has really been uh, wonderful. And um, on behalf of the Kegley Institute of Ethics, uh, welcome everyone to the 15th annual Kegley Institute of Ethics Fall Lecture, featuring uh, Rune Gandhi and Nipun Mehta. Uh, it's, it's really wonderful, uh, speaking as the director of the Institute and uh, on behalf of our board of directors, um, just really wonderful to organize these events and have so many different aspects of our community come together. Uh, students, faculty, community members, staff. It's really what we're about, um, bringing people together to have important conversations about pressing issues, um, not only in our region, but also in our world. So just thank you for being here and being part of uh, this event. Um, I want to just reiterate the, the thank you for our sponsors uh, who make this work possible. Um, as mentioned by uh, Dr. Zelezny and Dr. Patel. And also just a special note of um, the importance of the collaboration that we've had with the Gandhi Celebration Committee and the Ravi and Nina Patel Foundation. Um, it's truly been a collaborative effort. These events are planned over the course of a year and everybody's done so much to make this possible and I'm personally extremely grateful for that. So thank you so much. So we have a special event today. We have, we have two speakers for you, um, and we'll be able to engage with both in some question and answer periods. So our first speaker, um, it's an honor to introduce, uh, is, is Nipun Mehta. Um, Nipun is the founder of servicespace.org, which is an incubator of projects that support a gift culture or gift economy, as Nipun refers to it as well. And over the last 15 years, Nipun's work has reached millions of people attracted more than 500,000 volunteers, and mushroomed into numerous service projects. Among his many prestigious accolades, President Obama appointed him on a council for social change. The Dalai Lama recognized him as an unsung hero of compassion. And Germany's Ohm magazine named him top 100 most inspiring people of 2018. Yeah. Uh, I want to say also just personally, uh, I emailed a lot with Nipun over the past several months. I've never known somebody who could, whose compassion could come through so clearly on an email. It's actually like, amazing to me. I, was, I felt positive after receiving Nipun's emails, uh, which is a special skill. You need to teach me how to do that because I email a lot. Um, tirelessly, he has addressed thousands of gatherings around the, around the world, speaking next to wide-ranging leaders from Apple co-founder Steve Wozniak to author Elizabeth Gilbert to civil rights legend John Lewis. Nipun's mission statement in life reads, bring smiles in the world and stillness in my heart. And his talk today is titled, Gandhi 3.0, Bridging Internet and the Internet. Please join me in welcoming Nipun Mehta. My claim to fame is I know how to send emails with smiley faces. <laughs> Um, thank you. It's a joy to be here. Um, I am, as soon as the slides come up, uh, going to talk about this idea of Gandhi 3.0. Um, I'm from the Silicon Valley, and we like to put version numbers on everything, and we don't spare Gandhi either, you know, so <laughs> I'll tell you more about what that means. Um, but I, I want to share uh, some about Gandhi, some about this new manifestation of Gandhi, how it can take place and really focus on three key shifts at the end, which I think apply to all of us in our personal lives, but also in the systemic solutions that we create. Um, so I, I want to start with something. I, I, I don't know how this happens, but it happens how, like, I'm coming to Bakersfield, I'm talking about Gandhi, and Google knows about it somehow. 
And so Google's like, you may also like to read. And so it sent me this link uh, from two days ago in, on time, in Time magazine. It was letters that Gandhi wrote, two letters in particular. And one of them opened like this. It says, dear friend, that I address you as a friend is no formality. I own no foes. My business in life has been, for the past 33 years, to enlist the friendship of the whole of humanity by befriending mankind, irrespective of race, color, or creed. Most of us know about Gandhi, so I won't go more into that, but this was a letter he wrote to Hitler. And this is how he started. People on two different ends of the spectrum. And this is before the war. This is 1940. This right around the wartime, he was trying to convince him to stop the war. And this is how he opened the letter. So we know a lot about Gandhi, the leader. He had all kinds of positions in education, politics, military, gender, caste. You can go down the list. And you can keep on debating whether he should have erred a little bit on this side or a little bit on this side. And those are his policies. And, and intellectual people do like to do that. And that's, that has its place in the world. But for me, what's really inspiring is what he was pursuing. And that I think of as Gandhi the man. Right? Who was this seeker? On a Monday, every Monday he was silent. And on one of those Mondays, this reporter comes to him and asks him, he says, uh, you know, uh, Gandhi, what's your message to the world? It was actually in between. Whenever Gandhi would go in a train from one place to another, he would get out at every train station, every stop, and throngs of people would be there just for a minute, just for a glimpse, and then some guy, you know, yells out, you know, it's like, hey, what's your message to the world? And he kind of takes his, uh, he was a journalist, so he takes his uh, pen and paper and he writes down, my life is my message. And that's, that's incredible if you really start to nuance it and go a little further. So I think what happens all too often um, is we struggle with looking at such a giant personality and reflect on, hey, how can I bring this spirit into my daily context, into our current world, into the culture that we're embedded in? Unfortunately and sadly, very polarized culture. Is Gandhi still relevant? All those sorts of questions. One of my friends asked me something very, or he pointed out something very interesting. He says, you know, Gandhi was amazing, but he had it easy. I was like, oh yeah? Okay, well, let's see where this is going. Um, and he knows I'm a Gandhi fan, and so he, he was saying it uh, with sincerity and love, and he says, you know, at his time, what he was opposing, he, Gandhi would never call it his enemy, what he was opposing was easily identifiable. It looked like this. And if you go a little farther down and you look at, you know, R Rosa Parks, you, easy to identify who's Rosa Parks in that photo. You go a little farther down and you look at this man standing in front of the Chinese tanks. He was anonymous. We still don't know who he is. But still we can spot who's, the, who's doing the aggression and who's trying to resist. You go a little farther and this is the first glacier that started melting. Hard to know what you're opposing. Much more complicated. You look at inequality in the world. Eight men who can fit in this golf cart own more financial wealth than the bottom 3.5 billion people, half of the planet. But no one knows how to solve it. I used to go to the White House every, every month, right? We would have these meetings with the ex experts. No one knows how to solve it. Much harder to find what we're opposing there. You go to the grocery store, you look at a tomato, and a tomato is a tomato is a tomato, but not quite. Genetically modified tomatoes, very hard to discern. And what are you opposing? Can you even identify what you're opposing? And you can go into the tech, you know, I'm from the Silicon Valley, right? So this is like, you know, this is Mark Zuckerberg announcing this multi-billion dollar takeover of the Oculus uh, Rift, this big moment in tech. This is a few years ago. And this is the photo that Facebook themselves put out. And nobody's looking at him. He's like this proud moment he's going and he's, no one's looking at him because they're all after your mind share. Right? These virtual reality things. It becomes very hard to figure out where the opponent is. It becomes very subversive. And then a couple days ago, 
I saw this in the Washington Post. He says, hey, Google, let me talk to my departed father. So it turns out that instead of me and you SMSing each other directly, what if we go through this machine and that machine figures out my personality? So after I pass away, you, it can still give you these emails that sound like me. This is Washington Post heavily funded, right? And it's like, you know, this is another company that they featured in there. Never lose someone you love, right? Who wants to live forever? And we're designing for this kind of permanence as opposed to embracing impermanence. And living in this kind of context, we do have to ask the question, how would someone like Gandhi respond? How are Gandhian values, how, how is his own personal pursuit relevant uh, in these times where it becomes so much more uh, pervasive, uh, or subversive rather, the problems become very subversive. So we design who we are ultimately. And who we are individually is how we design our individual lives, uh, but how we are collectively is also how we create the systems in the world. And I think Gandhi, there's a famous quote, which technically he didn't say, but that we all know, you must be the change you wish to see in the world. And that's, that's great, we should completely be... Well, what Gandhi said is essentially that we are designing who we are, but his actual quote is actually way deeper than just this approximation. His actual quote is, we but mirror the world. All the tendencies present in our outer world are to be found in the world of our body. If we could change ourselves, the tendencies in the world would also change. As a man changes his own nature, so does the attitude of the world change towards this. This is the divine mystery supreme. And he designed the entire movement based on these principles. That outer change, sustainable external social change, is predicated on inner change. You, change, you start here first and that ripples outside. Outside won't necessarily ripple out inside. Um, there are so many examples of this. So yesterday night, last night, we were having a conversation after, after a talk, and someone was asking me about fasting, you know, and says, Gandhi used to fast. And if you think about it, if you guys don't get along, two sides, and I say, I'm going to fast until you start talking, that's a bit coercive. Right? And you're like, well, that's pretty violent. Would Gandhi do that? I mean, that's the story we hear. But have we actually asked him why he was fasting? Was it really just to bring these guys together? Or was he doing something subtler, something different? Vinoba asked him, his, his successor in India asked him one time, how do you decide when to fast? And he, and he says, well, I listen to my inner voice. He says, well, how did you decide how to do it 21 days? Why not 22 and 23? And he told Vinoba, I asked my inner voice. So he was led by this inner voice, Narayan Dada, who was... Uh, who, who was Gandhi's secretary's son, who just passed away, whom I had the privilege of knowing, told me the story of how, you know, pre Dandi march, everyone is looking to Gandhi saying, what are you going to do? And Gandhi says to Tagore, Gandhi says, you know, when Tagore asked him, you know, Bapu, what's going on? What's the strategy? He didn't have think tankers around him. He responded, he says, I don't know, but you can be sure that I'm praying. I mean, that's the father of a nation putting all chips on the table for in prayer, in inner transformation, in what's going on inside to create a ripple on the outside. And this creates a kind of soul force. This was the basis of everything that he did. When he fasted, for example, this is Eknath Ishwaran, whose books many people would know. Eknath Ishwaran tells the story of how he had, he, he never personally encountered Gandhi, but he said when Gandhi would fast, I'm thousands of miles away, thousands of kilometers away, and I somehow couldn't eat. And there were so many people in the country that were moved in this sort of a way. Einstein said in 500 years, we're not even going to believe that a guy like Gandhi existed. You know, this is Tagore, who disagreed with him on so many, in so many ways, and very publicly, who yet says, we cannot just call this guy Gandhi, it has to be Mahatma, a pure soul. And Raman Maharishi, this great Indian mystic, who is not going to be affected when, when things change, when people pass away, when Gandhi passed away, he was in tears and teary-eyed for three days. Dalai Lama, when he got the Nobel Peace Prize, actually dedicated it to Mahatma Gandhi because that was his inspiration. At his grave, he saw a vision as a teenager to say, I'm going to embrace nonviolence. 
And Obama, when he went there for the first time, he says, I am mindful that I might not be standing before you today as the president had it not been for Gandhi. So we understand all this, but I think, so how, how can, where does it go in our current context? How do we apply it in our current context? And as a simplification, I, for me, and the way I view it, and this is just my view, and I'm not a scholar, I, I'm not even a devotee of Gandhi, I'm just a person who really appreciates what he sought. And I, in my own small ways, try to seek those things as well. But what I see in Gandhi is that he is against these three M's. Right? The military, which is obvious, markets, which is less obvious, and media. Of course, he was really savvy with media, but the kind of mass media that's out there uh, is, is, was very anti uh, what Gandhi really stood for. And I'll explain this in a second. But I think if we look deeply at what Gandhi did, he didn't oppose. He never opposed any person in general. What he was really good at is composting. So he would take these resources that don't work and he would compost it. All too often, these are the fruits. But we have so much of these three M's in our world that if we're able to compost it and do something constructive out of it and create these different fruits in the world, that, that would work. And I think that was the Gandhian approach. So he looks below the surface. If they're above the surface, then you're in trouble. But he looks at this money, power, fame, and he says, how do I compost it? And there are so many examples. Uh, Ravi talked about uh, South Africa, right? The military. The guy who opposed him was John Schmutz, General Schmutz. Was, you know, was the guy who put him in jail. And when he puts him in jail one time, uh, Gandhi's like, you know what? I think what I'm going to do is make a gift for the guy who put me in jail. And so he makes him these shoes. And it turns out, as history goes, Gandhi actually ends up winning. And so his, the guy, and these are the shoes. These are the sandals, I suppose. Um, but General Schmutz, you know what he says? He says, it was my honor to lose to somebody like Gandhi. And he wore these for a little bit, and after a while he says, you know, I'm not fit enough of a man to walk in these shoes that Gandhi has given me with great love, that he has made with his hands with great love. So yes, he opposed military, he opposed violence, but he was able to successfully compost it to build these blossoming relationships and much more. Similarly with markets, we don't need to tell, talk more about Gandhi's simplicity. These were the eight, nine things that he had to his name when he was assassinated. This is all. Media, right? This is, everyone has heard of this, the story of my experiments with truth, his autobiography. But when he actually first published the draft, he sent it to, you know, like we would, right? You send it to your buddy for review. So he sent it to his buddy for review. He sent it to Vinoba. And he says, uh, hey, Vinoba, what do you think? And Vinoba, being a saintly person himself, right, he, he doesn't really go deep into it. Vinoba says, uh, yeah, I don't, think it can, I don't think it'll do any harm. <laughs> like, talk about a compliment. Like, oh, you've been working on this for a long time? Yeah, I, I don't think it can do any harm. And Gandhi responds to that, and he says, good, because the sole purpose of all our work is to be zero. And the kinds of things that Gandhi put inside his book, and in general, his approach to sharing, if he was trying to manipulate the masses and create, a nice, create nice messaging and have like this whole team, he wouldn't be Gandhi. Right? He was not really trying. He was just, con he composted the media really well, but he was not really working at that level. So I think what Gandhi teaches us at some level is to hold suffering of the world with great compassion, to stay big-hearted in the presence of suffering, not in the absence, not to run away and practice it out here, but really, in the thick of the mud, find conditions to grow and bloom that lotus. Now, the 3.0 part. Now, Gandhi, now such, such a man, leading from inside out, Gandhi, during his time, all he could do was broadcast, because that was the world that we lived in. Those were the constructs, one to many sort of like what I'm doing now. Right? That was all that was feasible at that time. But post-Gandhi came this guy, Gandhi's successor, Vinoba Bhave. And Vinoba did something very interesting, what I would call Gandhi 2.0,
Vinoba had access to everything, and yet what he ended up doing, and first of all, Gandhi had immense respect for Vinoba. Like he, he said, he coined the word Satyagraha, and he says, you want to know who a real Satyagraha is? And he had very high aspirate, uh, very high sort of markers for who a Satyagraha is. He says, this guy, Vinoba. And so whenever people would have like a spiritual question, they would be like, okay, go to Vinoba. You know? So Vinoba is this uh, remarkable figure, and what he did is he didn't copy Gandhi, and he didn't say, now I will be the next leader. He walked village to village. He started to connect people to people. He had this famous land gift movement that most of you might have heard of. He goes to a rich landowner and he says, hey, you know, you have all this land, you have so much. If you have five kids, what would you do when you pass away? And he says, well, I would distribute the land amongst the five. He says, would you adopt me as your sixth son? And I don't want one-sixth of your land, but would you donate one-sixth of your land to your brother, to your sister in your own community? Five million acres of land were contributed in this way. Unprecedented in human history. And he was on the cover of Time magazine, and, and what, you can't, what you probably can't read there, he says, he says it very openly. He comes in and he says, I've come to loot you with love. <laughs> he literally did. Right? People just were flocking to give it to him. Um, but that was Gandhi 2.0. He created not a one-to-many, but a one-to-one -one kind of a network. And what both of them talked about, and what I think what we are seeing now, is, oh, here's Vinoba saying, actually, the sole purpose was not the five million acres. The sole purpose of my work was actually to connect heart to heart, one to one. And we saw this. My wife and I went on a walking pilgrimage, and we saw the power of, of this. But I think what both of them talked about is this Gandhi 1.0, 2.0, and the possibility of 3.0. Vinoba put it really well. He says, it's like a fountain that comes up, and as it comes down, it's going to be in so many distributed drops all over the world. He says, there was time for Jai Hind, which is glory to India, to Jai Jagat, which is glory to the world. And this is the many-to-many -many era. And putting on my Silicon Valley hat, right, if you look at networks, and this is just math, Right? You don't need to be a Gandhi fan to understand this. This is just basic. It's, you go, if you look in a one-to-many network in a room full of 50 people, you would have 50 connections. Oh, I'll get to that. This is the visual of uh, one-to-many, uh, one-to-one, and many-to-many. -many. In a room full of 50 people, Sarnoff's law says you would have 50 connections. Right? Metcalf's law says in a room full of uh, 50 people with one-to-one -one connections, you would have 1,225 connections. But in a many-to-many -many network, in a group-forming network, in a room full of just 50 people, the number of connections that are possible, which is what Reed's Law tells us, is 100 million trillion. So, you know, all those people, sometimes we get into these business settings and we're like, oh, let's just, let's, and let's everybody connect because there's so many problems in the world, let's work. And you're like, okay, that's good, that's better than one to many. But man, we're talking 100 million trillion connections, and that's just with 50 people. Think of how many connections, we have so many people here in the room, think of how many connections are possible here if we're able to drop these boundaries in our minds. Another way to visualize this is to go from a centralized model to a decentralized model to distributed, which is really to think about it in terms of our external systems. You can think about it as uh, you know, your TV model, which is broadcast, your telephone model, which started off just as one-to-one, -one, and your internet world. And we have seen this play itself out for profit and protest, but we have not seen it for love. So we need to create more of those experiments in a many-to-many -many way, leading with inner transformation, supporting the capacities of the internet to create these Gandhi 3.0 sorts of possibilities. So service space, in some sense, is an organization I run. Uh, thank you, Michael, for the introduction. Uh, we've been running it for 20 years, and you know, we started in the Silicon Valley, and, and now it's spread all over the world. It's doing lots of wonderful things, but if you had to ask me what's a core sort of shift, I would say that it's about going from leadership, which is about command and control, plan and execute, to leadership, which is about searching and amplifying, looking at the relationships in between, trusting in the flow. 
And through, so four, I want to leave you with three sort of shifts of laddership, which I think we have learned through our own experience and practice. Uh, and I think they're applicable in so many aspects of how we design our lives, how we design our relationships, and how we design our culture. Uh, the first shift is to really expand from money as wealth to realizing money is a form of wealth, and there are so many other forms of wealth. Right? So, this is a story that I, 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 I don't know if I have time, but I'm going to do it anyways. Do I have time? Yeah. I, Michael says, <laughs> Michael's like, yeah, you have time, and then like, no. <laughs> he, he didn't do that. He's a, um, I, I, I'll uh, tell you this story quickly. I'll skip the one after. Uh, this story really touched me. It's one of my friends was with Mother Teresa uh, volunteering in Calcutta, and some rich donor comes, and they uh, go around, and at the end, they say, I want to take a photo with Mother Teresa. And so they've got a photo up, and it's fantastic, and, and Mother Teresa is about to go, and then they said, well, uh, actually, that photo wasn't quite right. Can you move back a little bit and so take a better photo? Okay. Click. He says, ah, even that wasn't quite right. Can you move your face a little bit? <laughs> even that wasn't quite right. The photographer actually moves her face. And my friend watching this was so livid and says, you've got to be kidding me. You can't use an icon of compassion for your wall, right? And so she said, she, but Mother Teresa didn't say anything. So at the end, when these folks had left, she goes up and she says, Mother, why didn't you say anything? That was outrageous. And Mother Teresa gave one sentence that ended up flooring, my, changing my friend's life. She says, my dear, there are many forms of poverty. That yes, he didn't have financial poverty, but he had other kinds of poverty. And you know what? The kids that come to my doorstep and that are left as infants, and, and people go, with, they, have, they need material support. And I help them in that way. I help these people in that way. It doesn't matter. I'm just here to be in service. But through that, what she also taught us is that there are multiple forms of wealth. Right? The corollary is always true, but we're so pigeonholed into looking at just money as wealth. How do we expand um, beyond and say, hey, there's nature capital, there's attention capital, you know, there's knowledge capital, technology, time, we can all volunteer, compassion capital. How do we just be with each other? in a compassionate way. So how do we start to look at other forms of capital and start to think in terms of, it's not just time capital, what's the currency? What does it look like at scale? What's the benefit to society? We do so many things to keep money circulating, but we do almost nothing to keep so many other kinds of capital in flow. As a result, we sort of lose out on so many capacities of human beings. So I think this is the first shift to really hold this question, how do we encourage multiple forms of wealth. And Gandhi was remarkable at this. The second one is how do we move from broadcasting to deep casting? Deep casting, broadcasting is, you know, it's like I've got this message, I'm going to put it out, everyone's going to cover it. But when you see something on TV, you're not going to engage. Like with the conversations we had yesterday with all these people, they went way deeper because it wasn't just like a broadcasting. So how do we start to really learn what deep casting means. You know, this is my friend Pancho, very inspired, one of our volunteers, very inspired by Gandhi. And at some point at Occupy Oakland, uh, he was meditating. And the, these iconic photos of him meditating went viral. It was all over the world uh, on World News Tonight in so many places. He, he heard that the, the rhetoric of violence was getting, they were stepping it up. And so he says, I'm going to step up the rhetoric of nonviolence. I'm going to go and meditate on Ground Zero, right, where this the whole thing was going to clash. And, and of course, you know, as they're arrested, um, it happens to be a Monday, and so Pancho being Pancho, you know, he, he writes on his thing, brother, you know, I want you, to, I, I want you to hear that I love you. You know, that's just how Pancho sort of operates. But he was put in jail that day, and his offense, you have to write down offense, and his offense read, you know, he was put in jail for meditating, and his offense read, disturbing peace. <laughs> Pancho lives on the border of four gangs, uh, three, three gangs, and he calls the police the fourth gang. So they're like, all these people are always fighting. And he consciously lives there. And if you ask him, hey, what difference have you made in this community after four years? He says, you know what? Before, 
Whenever there was a gunshot in our community, everyone would close their doors and go inside. Now, whenever there's a gunshot, everybody would come out and say, this is my block, this is my community, this is where I belong, these are my people. If someone's firing a shot, someone is hurt underneath that violence, I want to go and address it because I'm related. He says, that's all I've done in four years. That is not broadcast, that is deep cast. And it asks us to invite this question, how do you scale on alternate forms of metric? We think about scale, which, which has a big heart, right? I want maximum number of people to benefit. But how do you scale on different metrics? Is it just the number of bodies is all you want? If it's just a cheap transmission that goes out, is that really as strong? And is that really the best we can do in a many-to-many -many era? Right? And the last shift is a shift from transaction to trust to move away from the singular one-to-one -one, uh, you know, direct reciprocity to something that's much more multidimensional, much more relational, and ultimately warrants this deep trust in our shared humanity. For some of you might know, uh, I, we run one of our experiments. We, we do a whole bunch of different experiments. One of our experiments is called Karma Kitchen, where it's, a really, it's an amazing example of transaction to trust. So you walk into this restaurant, and you, it's, it's a pop-up restaurant uh, run by volunteers on that particular day. You have a meal like you would anywhere else, and at the end of your meal, your check reads zero because someone before you has paid for you, and now you are trusted to pay forward whatever you want for people after you. Would people give? Or are we just all selfish, as economics tells us? And so we tried this, and guess what? It was amazing. People respond to love with greater love. People respond to smiles with greater smiles. People respond to generosity with greater generosity. And they came out with a paper at UC Berkeley studying this in so many other settings under academic scrutiny. And the title of that paper, Paying More When Paying for Others. So there's lots of stories which I shall skip. <laughs> I, I, Michael's like, man, my job was just to get people in here. Now I'm done. I'm retiring. <laughs> um, it, uh, I, you, you have to, uh, honestly, should I tell a story or should I? Okay, awesome, awesome. For those of you that didn't hear that on the live stream, he, Michael just told me how much he loves me. <laughs> um, I, I, I'll tell you a story and then and we'll end with a video that, of God. But this is uh, what happens in a space like this. It's, it's beautiful. Uh, when we shift from transaction to trust. Right? So I, I was volunteering one time, and this guy walks in with like six other people, and he's like, what is this kind of place? Like, wow, like, why is everyone so happy? The check is zero, he can't understand it. He hasn't even received the check, he's just reading the menu where it explains the idea. It's like, what's going on? And he sees the waiter, they all put their order in, and he looks at the guy who's, who's a volunteer waiter, server, we, we called him, and he looks at him and he's like, you know, Hey, that's, uh, this is really sweet what you guys are doing. And uh, by the way, that shirt you're wearing, that's awesome. That's a really nice, it was a Karma Kitchen t-shirt. Uh, where can I buy one? And this guy says, you know, Karma Kitchen doesn't really do buy and sell. So it's, I don't know where to buy it, but I got it because I, I'm volunteering here. So maybe you should volunteer. The guy's like, okay. <laughs> this guy goes back in, uh, the volunteer. He comes to me and he's like, hey, Nipun, psst, do you have another shirt? And I thought maybe he spilled something. I was like, yeah, you know, all right, yeah, I've got another shirt. I didn't have a Carver Kitchen shirt, but I had another one. So he puts that on. He goes outside to this table and tells this guy. He packages this nice little thing. He's like, hey, brother, this is for you. Took out literally the T-shirt off his back, and he put a note, note on it. He says, please, laundry before using. <laughs> <laughs> this guy is so moved. He's like, where in the world are you going to get, like, you know, hey, nice shirt, and the next thing you know, like, the shirt's on your table. And at some point, before even paying the check for the person after them, he takes, he takes out his wallet, and he's like, he happened to have the, these gift cards, and he calls, he says, look, you guys, what you guys are doing is amazing. I really stand for this worldview, and here's two gift cards. It was like $50 each, 100 bucks, right? eBay gift card, because he worked at eBay. And so he, he says, this is for Karma Kitchen. So this guy comes to me, and he says, this guy just gave a hundred bucks, man. We should do this t-shirt thing more often. 
<laughs> and, and volunteers aren't even supposed to look at how much you get. You know? And so here you are, you're, you're getting, you know, so he's processing this. I said, who's this for? He says, Karma Kitchen. I said, who's Karma Kitchen? He's like, it's all of us. Why don't you tell him to go gift it to a random table? And so he goes back. He says, sir, thank you. We really appreciate your gratitude. But Karma Kitchen is all of us. And why don't you just, and this guy's like, who are you guys, you know? <laughs> What's going on? And he says, look, I'm an introvert. I, I'm not comfortable going to a table, but if you want to, and this guy did, and you can imagine the kinds of ripple effects that happen there. And this is the kind of thing that when you create a context for deeper trust, so many beautiful things can emerge that otherwise just wouldn't get emerged. It would, just wouldn't happen. Like, and what happened on those two tables is a story for another day. But that was equally inspiring. So you're just taking a casual moment, but because of this context of trust, so many things rise up. And I think that's what we can do. This guy runs a rickshaw in India with the, in the same way. You sit in my rickshaw, no charge. Not because it's free, but because you're trusted to pay forward. It's been incredible. Everyone looking at him is like, oh, who's doing this? Who's the organization? He's like, no organization. I just turned from transaction to trust. And he needs money every day, but he's willing to bet in your love. This is a guy who runs a magazine in this way. This is a woman who runs an acupuncture clinic in a similar sort of a way. And so I think what it, what it really asks us is how do we go from these singular transactions to much more multidimensional relationships? And if those relationships are rooted in generosity, it really allows us to trust that field and creates the transformations that we need by the organic propensity of our, human, of our humanness. And so this is another question of how do we start to bring this kind of a spirit more into our ecosystems. So let me end with a video. Um, this is a video uh, that I think most of you, uh, you've probably seen Attenborough's film. It's a short one minute clip from it. Um, I, I'll just let it play. It's the funeral the scene object of Gandhi. of this massive tribute died as he had always lived. A private man without wealth, without property, without official title or office. Mahatma Gandhi was not the commander of armies nor a ruler of vast lands. He could not boast any scientific achievement or artistic gift. Yet men, governments, dignitaries from all over the world have joined hands today to pay homage to this little brown man in the loincloth who led his country to freedom. In the words of General George C. Marshall, the American Secretary of State, Mahatma Gandhi has become the spokesman for the conscience of all mankind. He was a man who made humility and simple truth more powerful than empires. And Albert Einstein added, generations to come will scarce believe that such a one as this, ever in flesh and blood, walked upon this earth. Man who owned. Man who owned just these things shook the world. No money, no political office, no real other resources in some sense, but this great resource of compassion, this great trust in humanity. And it sounds easy, and it should, but I think the challenge is that we need to learn to be patient to hold this. This is a photo uh, from the state of Meghalaya in India where they tried to build these bridges across two banks, across these two polarities that we're all really trying to build. And they realize that as soon as they bring the cement in, it all gets crushed. But what ended up staying were these living bridges. And the way these living bridges are done, they're made from roots of trees. So you can't do this with getting a Fortune 500 company and putting up a bridge tomorrow, right? Or the next year. This bridge takes 500 years to make because every generation knows that you do that one small thing and you pass that knowledge on to the kids and they know how to connect the roots to the next roots and bit by bit by bit by bit, you have this incredibly resilient living bridge. And I think this is what Gandhi was always after, to create 
He, he, a lot of feedback loops ended up closing in his time, but there's a lot of feedback loops that will continue. The ripple effect of Gandhi will continue for a long time because he was doing something very subtle and yet very real, something that we can all recognize, which is unconditional love. And I would invite us, all of us, to not just take this as some exemplary action, which it is, not some inspiration, which it is, but also to bring it in our lives. I would invite all of us, there's a bunch of smile cards outside for you guys. A smile card says, I'm going to do one small act of kindness with this kind of great love. And it's small and it's invisible. No one will put you in the papers for it, but you know what? 500 years from now, it may create a ripple effect. You pay toll for the car behind you, and you tell them that they don't know me, but give them a smile card. Then the smile card says, you don't know who did this, but keep the chain going. Pay it forward for somebody else. You go talk to a janitor, talk to a bus driver, write him a letter of appreciation, and says, you don't know me, leave a smile card, and see what happens. Most of the times they'll say, oh, no one's appreciated me in my 30 years that I've been driving a bus. And it takes you just a couple of minutes. It doesn't even take too many resources. So how do we start to put this out? Not for immediate feedback loops, not for broadcast, but with this deep cast. Not for transaction, what you get in return, but for the trust in the circle of life. So I hope all of us here, we have hundreds of millions or trillions of connections that are feasible. I hope all of us can tap into that spirit, do that small act, connect with each other. And I'm certainly here as, as your brother, and I'm available for hugs later. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Nipun, so much for the wonderful talk, inspiring talk. Um, so we have a bit of time for question and answer before I introduce our, our featured speaker, Arun Gandhi. Um, so uh, given the layout of the Dore, kind of the best way, we've done different experiments with the best way to do Q&A, but we have uh, student assistants. Uh, there should be one on this side and one on this side uh, with microphones. So if, if we have both over there, maybe one can go to this side here. And there's a microphone here. And what I ask you to do is I ask you to raise your hand. Um, I'll point you out. They'll pass the microphone to you. Please make sure you use the microphone for your question because we are live streaming this so people watching all over can, can hear you um, when you do it that way. And then when you're done with your question, just pass it back to the student assistant so they can give it to somebody else, okay? So uh, do we have a first question? I saw a hand over here. Um, sir? Okay, yeah, you can pass the microphone to you. Oh, do we have one already there? Okay, sure. You have the microphone right there, so you can grab that and give it to him. There you go, yeah. Good morning to everybody. Good morning. I have a very simple question. Uh, how much time I have? So we can do multiple questions, maybe just yeah, give it somewhat brief. Okay. First question is, and I know many people here, they are from India and Pakistan. Why India was divided into Pakistan and uh, India? You know, that's, uh, that is one question. That's great, yeah. And the other one is about the violence. Violence has started since and that is everybody talking about the Mahatma Gandhi, and I respect him. He was a great person. And nonviolence has started since 1948 in Kashmir, and it is going on right at this moment. Mm -hmm. Where are those followers of Mr. Mahatma Gandhi? They don't stop. If, they, if you don't have the answer yet, I know India was divided on a religious basis. Where there was a majority of Muslims, that was a Pakistan. And where are the majority of Hindus and, and Sikhs, that was a Bharat or India. And since the majority in Kashmir has been, and it is even today, majority. And by force, it was annexed to with India. Right, yeah. And where is that nonviolence which we are talking and listening and reading every day? 
That's, and, and you that's guys it. are disrespecting your own leader, what he has been doing. That is a non-violence. There are beautiful stories you told, and they are good. You are a good math mathematician, look like, lot of experience, but check on this non-violence lesson from Gandhi. Thank, Thank you. you. Great. Um, I want to respond to that. Um, I, I'm happy to. I think the, the question is, uh, so first of all, all the debates of, okay, there's so much violence in the world, there's so many problems with India, how much was Gandhi a part of it, that's all above my pay grade. Uh, so I, I, I don't have an answer to that. Um, but I think I do have an answer to, uh, I have been with many Gandhians, and I do have an answer to that question of where are the Gandhians. Uh, and I think that question is here and there. Or do you care? to create a nonviolent world? If so, what are you doing about it? This is the question I ask my own self. Right? What am I doing about it, and how can that ripple out? And for me, that's an, that's an important question. Of course, it's a significant question of how this goes out into the systems, and maybe our distinguished speaker is more equipped uh, to respond to that. Uh, but I think there's also a lot of science behind it. If you talk about the virtue of nonviolence itself, they studied all major movements over the last couple of centuries, and it's so clear that nonviolent movements are far more effective than violent movements. So, nonviolence, I, I don't think there's any basis uh, to argue against the merits of nonviolence versus violence. Um, but I think what I have learned also from the Gandhians that I've been around, they said that if you do a satyagraha against injustice and it fails, we were talking about this last night. If you do that, what, what should be your response? And if you only intellectually understood Gandhi, if you've just read books about it, and if you're just using your head, your response is going to be, I need a stronger hammer. Where are the rest? Where is this love that's working? You know, like it's supposed to be working. Why is it not working right now? If, if, if you just have an intellectual response, that's where you're going to think. But all the amazing people, Arun Dada, who was here, who spent 40 years with Binoba, if you ask him this question, you know what he says? He says, what Binoba taught us. What Gandhi taught us is if their satyagra fails, you don't go for more power, you don't go for more coercion, you don't say this has not worked, you actually work the other way. And you say, how can I create a gentler satyagra? And if the gentler satyagra doesn't work, you say, how can I create an even more gentler satyagra? And if that doesn't work, how do you create an even gentler one? When Sam Dong Rinpoche, last night I was sharing this story, he was uh, you know, second in command, in command, so to speak, uh, in the Tibetan government in exile, prime minister after the Dalai Lama. We were on a panel once and someone says, what has your nonviolence done for, you know, for, uh, for, for your country and your people? You're up against China, it's failing in every single metric. And Sam Dong Rinpoche responded in such a beautiful way, in such a succinct way, that still stayed with me. He says, it's not that nonviolence has failed, it is that our practice of nonviolence is imperfect. Question. Yeah, or, or that's your job. I have a problem with random acts of kindness, speaking as a teacher. Uh -huh. We do not emphasize planned acts of kindness through giving up of our lives for our families, that nobody will know the acts of kindness that we've done for them, that nobody will pat us on the back. Yeah. So oftentimes they're left behind speaking as a teacher, things I've seen. Nobody's going to know that you gave up time for your child or went grocery shopping for your wife. Things I've seen from my family that I'm thankful for from my mother. And I'm sure we've all seen. But not everybody has that benefit. Not everybody has a mother who is able to love them because they have problems in their lives. And paying for somebody's Starbucks behind you is not paying for that little child who didn't have breakfast. So what can we do with our love to reach out for people who are not like us, who did not have the benefit of love from infanthood on? 
That's my question. Thank you. That's good. I, I think that was a statement. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, we have time for uh, one more question, if uh, somebody has a question they'd like to raise. I'll just pass it over there. Thank you. Kind of lost for words. I apologize. My, my emotions are very close to the surface right now. I, I, I really wanted to thank you, all the speakers and everyone here, for coming to a community that needs this so much. And I'm, I'm humbled by, from the bottom of my heart, I'm, I'm, I'm honored to share this existence with all of you. That I'm. I'm humbled by all of your conscience presence. I feel the love that we all have for this great man that we're speaking of Gandhi and in this moment. I'm also humbled by this lowly Bakersfield that I feel like I've grown up in. I wanted to ask you, of all places in the world, why did you come here? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's true that we, first of all, for me, uh, I actually don't ask to speak anywhere. I don't particularly have an agenda. I lead where relationships go. Um, I, was, I happen to be, uh, you know, one of, the co one of the earliest volunteers of Service Base. Her family lives here. I hadn't visited them for a long time, and so in April I ended up visiting them, and then this kind of ripple effect happened. So for me, at a very practical level, it's about just trusting in the relationships, and underneath the relationships, it's about being, being connected. Um, and I, I, I lead in that way, every, for me personally. Uh, but I think the reason why this is important is also because, like you beautifully pointed out, that we are holding so much in general of the suffering, of the separation of humanity. And it is very hard to stay big-hearted in the presence of that. You can always look at the other side. You know, there are many people who criticize acts of kindness, acts of love, even for other people. They say, oh, it's just a pacifier for the status quo. Because if you suffer, then you will want to create change and something will happen. But if you just go out and do an act of kindness, you're actually just keeping everything intact. And I can see the legitimacy of your, that view. It's not my view, because my experience is that when I do that small act, I think my wife is tuned in. Like one of the acts of kindness I do, I, I spoke about it yesterday, is I make, I've made tea for my wife every single morning since you know, see, she's Punjabi and she loves tea, you know. So for those of you that are Punjabi, you would know. Uh, she, you know, and, and, and that's a small act of kindness that doesn't go anywhere, but what it does is it actually changes the lens through which I look at the world, and I think that's very significant. Because if you, if you really forget that inner transformation and you're holding all this suffering, it's, you can easily become Fatalist, you're like, oh man, there's just no way. The only way we can solve this problem is through power and coercion and violence. Or the only way, I don't have time to practice my love. I don't have time to be kind. I don't have time to reach out to a stranger and be a friend because you know what? The whole world is burning. And so it is tough to actually hold both of these, to stay big hearted in the presence of, this, of your own suffering and the suffering of other people around you and actually the world at large. It is tough because we've created these systems where you're not going to hear the stories of Pancho in the news. You know what Pancho did? He went on a walking pilgrimage. He's an undocumented citizen of the world, hasn't had a bank account for six years, hasn't had an ID for 13 years. He says, I'm a human being. And he's not afraid. And so he walks. He says, I'm, I'm against the three M's. He says, no media, no mar markets, and no military. And so he decides to go on a walking pilgrimage from Oakland to the U.S.-Mexico border. And he climbs up that fence, and he puts the one world flag, because he says, I believe that we're all humans first, and then our small particulars, that I'm from this country or that country. 
And you look at people like that and you're like, man, what difference is that going to make? Right? You're like, yeah, you did that. I mean, no one even knows here. I'm the only one who knows about this. Like, what difference does it make? And if you become very fatalistic, then you start to lose faith in all these things. Then you're just like, oh my God, I just need to go, you know. But if you see what Pancho is doing there, he is eating vegan food in Tijuana right now. He takes these kids that have been completely traumatized at the border. He's the first person to bring them. And he told me the story just a couple days ago. He brings them out and he says, how do I, find, how do I bring up love in them? He takes them to the ocean to just play. Their moms are there, and these guys with military guns are around them because who knows what they're going to do, right? So they create this circle. They start sharing moments of inspiration. And in the middle of this, the, guy, the military with their guns are kind of softening a little bit. And Pancho looks him in the eye and he says, Brother, you know what you need right now is not those guns. You need swimming trunks because let's all go out into the ocean. In the presence of great suffering, he's not losing hope. He's not losing faith in this great love. And so I would invite all of us, this has been my practice. I mean, it, it may or may not be your practice. If, if it doesn't suit you, then that's fine. Uh, and I think more the merrier, all different paths to go to the top of the mountain, that's fine. But for me, what has been true and what I have learned from is to realize that when I do that small act with great love, when I make my wife tea, it doesn't get tiring. It doesn't reduce my capacity. It actually increases my gratitude, increases my capacity to give with even greater love. So I hope all of us can come together in that love. Thank you very much. I felt like you needed a little bit more. Up there. <laughs> Thank you so much, Nipun. So I want to... Uh, pause now to introduce our, our second and final speaker of the day. Um, and before I do that, actually, I think let's give Nipun one more round of applause for a great talk. Yeah, yeah. So it's an honor to have um, Arun Gandhi with us today. Um, when Arun arrived this morning, we were chatting a little bit, and I was, I was telling him, actually, that I saw him speak when I was an undergraduate student at Salisbury University. I was a young philosophy major uh, studying Gandhi and principles of nonviolence. Uh, and I actually still remember that talk vividly today. So it had a tremendous impact, um, including just the, the way he personalized Gandhi and the way he told stories that were just extremely impactful for my life. So thank you for that. And thank you for being with us today. So uh, Arun Gandhi was born in 1934. Uh, in Durban, South Africa, and he's the fifth grandson of India's legendary leader, Mohandas K. Mah or Mahatma Gandhi. For decades, Arun has shared the philosophy and lessons of nonviolence learned from Gandhi all around the world, including to hundreds and thousands of young students, high school students, university students, and so on. Arun and his late wife, Sunanda, founded several service and education organizations, including the Center for Social Change, the MK Gandhi Institute for Nonviolence, and the Gandhi Worldwide Education Institute. So it's very appropriate we have him here at our own educational institution today. And in addition, Arun has authored several books, including, uh, but not limited to, he has many, uh, I'll just list two of them, uh, Legacy of Love, My Education in the Path of Nonviolence from 2003, and uh, most recently, The Gift of Anger, and other lessons learned from my grandfather, Mahatma Gandhi, from 2017. Arun Gandhi's talk today is titled, Lessons Learned from My Grandfather, Nonviolence in a Violent World. Please join me in giving a warm Bakersfield welcome to Mr. Arun Gandhi. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here this morning and to be able to share with all of you some of the wonderful lessons that I learned from my grandfather and from my parents. But coming after Nipun, that's a hard act to follow. <laughs> he 
really did a wonderful job of bringing Gandhi into the 21st century. He's given you a new age concept of Gandhi. I'm going to try to give you the old age concept of Gandhi. <laughs> I don't know, perhaps you are aware of this or not, but 9-11-1906 was the first act of nonviolence that my grandfather launched in South Africa. And I think that day marks the day of the birth of sanity because his philosophy was about sanity. It was about civilization, about intelligence, about humanness, about com compassion. And he, wa he wanted to bring back sanity into a world that was filled with hate and prejudice and, and so much of uh, violence. And yet 9-11, 2001, we killed sanity by accepting violent ways of dealing with the conflict that we faced at that time. We are now embroiled in a war that we can't put an end to. And this is what my grandfather had uh, envisioned. He said, if you con continue with this culture of violence. You're just going to go deeper and deeper into it and eventually it'll destroy you and destroy your souls. But there was time and there still is time for us to reverse the procedure and save this world and save ourselves in the process. People have written tomes on Gandhi. Most of them have focused only on the philosophy as a way of resolving conflicts. And I think that his philosophy was much more than simply conflict resolution. It was about personal transformation. We may resolve conflicts peacefully, occasionally, but if we don't know what nonviolence is and if we don't practice nonviolence, we are going to continue to create conflicts in our life. And eventually we reach a stage when we say, well, nonviolence doesn't really work. Let's put an end to this conflict once and for all, and we resort to violence to destroy conflict. But in the process, we destroy ourselves and our own humanity. So his emphasis was that we need to become the change we wish to see in the world. If we want to be peaceful, if we want to create a peaceful world, a world where compassion and love and respect and understanding are more widely practiced than violence and all of these other negative things that, con that control us today, then we must become the change. I grew up in South Africa, as uh, Dr. Patel said, uh, and we have that common factor. There was one thing that I don't agree with him when he says that we are not related. I am related to him. We are human beings and as human beings we are all brothers and sisters. So he is... <laughs> but I grew up in South Africa and uh, at, at a time when there was tremendous amount of hate and prejudice. It seemed to me that everybody hated everybody there because uh, we just couldn't tolerate each other and we were fighting and killing each other. I became a victim at a very early age. I was beaten up by whites at the age of 10 uh, because they thought I was too black. And then by blacks, 
a few months later because they thought I was too white. <laughs> and it filled me with a lot of rage. And I wanted to fight back again. I wanted eye for an eye justice. And that's when my parents realized that it was time to go to India and give me the opportunity to live with grandfather and per perhaps learn something from him. And I'm very grateful to my parents for taking that decision because I think in many ways what he taught me at the time uh, made a very big difference in my life later on. I didn't realize it at that time. I must say I wasn't a very bright young boy to understand a profound philosophy at the age of 12. But uh, it, he, the way he taught this, uh, it, it remained in my mind. And, and uh, when I began to reflect on it as I grew up, I realized how important his message was. The first lesson that he taught me was about understanding anger and being able to channel that energy into constructive action. He said anger is like electricity. It's just as powerful and just as useful, but only if we use it intelligently. But it can be just as deadly and destructive if we abuse it. So just as we channel electrical energy and bring it into our lives and use it for the good of humanity, we must learn to channel anger in the same way so that we can use that energy for the good of humanity rather than abuse it and cause death and destruction. Harvard University recently did a study on this subject and they came to the conclusion that more than 80% of the violence that we experience in our lives or in the lives of our nations is generated by anger. We get angry and we just lash out and say things and do things in a moment of madness that we regret later on. But after having done the deed, there's really no point in regretting it. So we have to learn to stop ourselves from acting in a moment of madness. And for this, he taught me mental exercises. You know, we do so much of physical exercise because we are so concerned about a healthy body. We want to be strong and we want to be healthy. And so we go to the gym and we do running and raise, uh, all kinds of things and try to build a body. But we never think about our minds of building a healthy and strong mind. We just assume that our mind uh, is strong enough to, uh, to consume all the, all the um, lessons we learn in schools and colleges, and that is enough. That is not enough. That is like filling your mind with a lot of knowledge, but if your mind is not trained to consume all that knowledge or process all that knowledge, it, it's not really going to be very beneficial. And so it's very important for us to do mental exercises as it is important for us to do physical exercise. He made me sit quietly in a room for a few minutes every day and hold in front of me something that gave me pleasure to look at. It could be a flower or it could be a photograph of somebody or whatever it was. Hold that in front of me for one minute, I had to concentrate my full attention on that object and then close my eyes and see for how long I could keep that image in my mind's eye. In the beginning, I found that the moment I closed my eyes, the image vanished because I didn't have that capacity to hold it. But when I began to do this exercise regularly every day, I found that I could keep that image longer and longer in my mind and to that extent my mind was coming under my control. And once you have control over your mind, then you don't lash out and do things that you regret. Then you move away from the situation and find ways 
of dealing with it more intelligently and constructively. And that is what using anger in, uh, intelligently and, and constructively means. But after learning this profound lesson from grandfather, I was just 12 years old at the time and quite a feisty 12 year old. And I wanted to see whether he himself had learned the lesson or not. <laughs> and I decided to test him. And this was the time in his life when he was concerned with many things. He was concerned about the emancipation of the so-called untouchable people, the emancipation of the Indian women, the education of children. So he had programs going on in all these different fields. And all these programs had to be funded. And he realized that the easiest way for him to raise the money was to uh, sell his autograph. And he put a fee of five rupees for each autograph. And while I was living with him, it was my duty to go out into the audience and collect the money and the autograph book and bring it to him for his signature. So after a few days of this, I thought to myself, if everybody could get his autograph, why not me? <laughs> after all, I'm his grandson and I deserve an autograph too. But I didn't have any money. So I got myself a little autograph book and I slipped it into the pile, hoping that he would notice the absence of money. But when he came to that book, he said, why is there no money for this autograph? And I said, because it's my book. And he said, well, you should know that I don't make an exception even for grandsons. <laughs> that if you want an autograph, you'll not only have to pay me for it, but you'll have to earn the money and pay me. Don't ask your parents for it. And I said, no way. I said, you are my grandfather and I'm going to make you give me this autograph free. <laughs> and he laughed and said, all right, let's see who wins. <laughs> and from that day, every day when he was in high level political discussions with Indian politicians or British politicians, I would barge into the room with my autograph book and thrust it in his face and demand an autograph. My logic was that just to get rid of me, he would sign the book and give it to me. But instead, every time I became too boisterous, all he did was put his hands across my mouth, press my head against his chest and went on talking politics. <laughs> on many occasions, uh, the other politicians used to get exasperated and tell grandfather, why don't you give him the autograph? He disturbs our meetings every day. <laughs> and grandfather said, this is a private joke between the two of us. You don't have to get involved. <laughs> the long and short of it is that he never did give me the autograph. <laughs> but he never ever told me to get out of the room and leave him alone like we would do with our children or our siblings when they're working, we are working on something important and they come to disturb us and we tell them very rudely sometimes, get out, can't you see I'm busy just now? He never ever told me to do that. And that's when I realized that if he could control his anger to that extent, if we attempt to achieve 50% of it, we would make a tremendous difference in the violence that we experience today. So I can't emphasize enough the importance of learning how to deal with our anger. It's not something that we need to be ashamed of. What we need to be ashamed of is how we abuse this very powerful emotion. So we can learn to use it intelligently and it could serve a very good purpose in bringing peace in this world. But equally important, I think, was the lesson that he taught me over a little pencil. A little three-inch butt of a pencil became a very important lesson for me. I was coming back from school one day and I had this pencil in my hand and it was about three inches long and 
I thought to myself, I deserve a better pencil. This is too small for me to use. And without a second thought, I just threw the pencil away because I was so sure grandfather would give me a new pencil when I asked him for it. But that evening when I met grandfather and asked him for a new pencil, instead of giving me one, he subjected me to a lot of questions. <laughs> he wanted to know how the pencil became small and where did I throw it away and why did I throw it away and on and on. And I couldn't understand why he was making such a fuss over a little pencil until he told me to go out and look for it. <laughs> and I said, you must be joking. He said, you don't expect me to look for a little pencil in the dark? He said, oh yes, I do, here's a flashlight. <laughs> and he sent me out with the flashlight to look for this pencil and I think I spent about two hours searching for it. And when I finally found it and brought it to him, he said, now I want you to sit here and learn two very important lessons. The first lesson is that even in the making of a simple thing like a pencil, we use a lot of the world's natural resources. And when we throw them away, we are throwing away the world's natural resources. And that is violence against nature. And the second lesson is that because in an affluent society we can afford to buy all these things in bulk, we overconsume the resources of the world. And because we overconsume them, we are depriving people elsewhere of these resources and they have to live in poverty. And that is violence against humanity. And that was the first time I realized that all of these little things that we do every day, consciously and unconsciously, things that we overconsume and destroy and throw away because we have so much of it and we can afford to do it, that all of that constitute violence of some sort towards nature or towards other human beings. To make me understand this lesson thoroughly, he made me draw a genealogical tree of violence. Just as we do a family tree with violence as the grandparent and physical violence and passive violence as the two branches. And every day before I went to bed, I had to analyze and examine everything that I had experienced during the day things that I may have done to other people or people may have done to me or things that I may have read about. All of this had to be analyzed and examined and put in their appropriate places on that tree. Now physical violence is something we all understand because we see it and it hurts so much. It's all the kinds of violence where we use physical force against one another. But passive violence is something that we don't even recognize. We don't even think of it as being violent. It is all the kinds of things that we do to one another without using any violence. And yet we hurt people, directly or indirectly, consciously or unconsciously. Our actions hurt somebody somewhere. It may be thousands of miles away, but it does hurt. And that is passive violence. And the way I had to determine this was to ask myself the simple question. If somebody were to do this to me, would I be helped by it or would I be hurt by it? And if I came to the conclusion that it would hurt me, then that would be passive violence. And when I began to do this introspection, I was amazed that within a few months I was able to fill up a whole wall in my room with acts of passive violence. The physical violence didn't grow very much because there's a limit to what you can do physically. But passive violence grew endlessly. And that is when he explained to me the connection between the two. He said, we commit passive violence all the time, every day, consciously and unconsciously. 
and that generates anger in the victim and the victim then resorts to physical violence to get justice. So it is passive violence that fuels the fire of physical violence. So logically, if we want to put out that fire of physical violence, we have to cut off the fuel supply. And since the fuel supply comes from each one of us, we have to become the change we wish to see in the world. If we don't change our attitudes and our behavior and our uh, relationships with each other, we will never be able to bring peace in this world. So we have to examine our own weaknesses. That is something that he used to emphasize very strongly in all of us. That we have to look at our own weaknesses and transform those weaknesses into strengths. That is the true education. If we don't do that, then we continue to live with all those weaknesses and we just go round and round in circles and, and uh, do the same thing over and over again until we perish. That is what he did in his life. As you know, he grew up a very ordinary person. He was quite an ordinary student when he was a young boy. There was nothing very uh, uh, special about him. When he grew up and went to England and studied law, he became very aggressive, he became very uh, self-conscious, he became very proud, and he, he had a high stature and, uh, and he thought of himself as being very special. He could only travel by first class, he would only uh, do certain things. He, he thought that he was a brown Englishman. He was not, not special at all. But at that point in his life he realized, that where am I going with my life? What am I doing with my life? And is this what I want to achieve? And he realized that he was on the wrong path. And he started making the adjustments there. So he replaced the greed with compassion. He replaced the selfishness with selflessness. And he began to evolve and eventually became a Mahatma. He was not born a Mahatma. He became a Mahatma through his hard work and through the sacrifices that he made there. And he believed that all of us can achieve that. Maybe not reach the goal of becoming a Mahatma, but becoming better human beings. We have to continuously do that. We don't become better human beings because we get a university degree and, uh, and, a, and a certificate to prove it. We become better human beings only when we are being respected by other people, by people who don't even know us, who respect us because we are, have in some ways affected and touched their lives. That would be the ideal way of uh, each one of us living our life so that when we die, people will regret having lost us because we contributed so much to their, to their life and to the society as a whole. And if we can achieve that little progress in our life, we can make a big difference in bringing peace there. Today our relationships with each other are based on self-interest. We are always thinking about what am I going to gain from this relationship and if I don't gain anything from it, you know, why should I bother to build a relationship? And that is why our relationships are based on 
so such n uh, delicate um, threads that they break off very quickly and every time we break a relationship, we are creating the potential for a conflict. So relationship in a culture of nonviolence are built on the four principles of respect, understanding, acceptance, and appreciation. We have to respect ourselves and respect our connection with each other and with all of creation. You know, we have this myth uh, in the modern world that we are independent individuals and we can do whatever we like and it's nobody's business. We are not independent individuals. We are all interdependent, interconnected and interrelated. Not only as human beings, but with all of creation. And it's only when we respect that, that we will understand who we are and what we are and why are we here on earth. We are not here to just go around in circles from birth to death, doing the same thing over and over again and, and passing the time of day. We are here for a purpose. Each one of us has a purpose in life. And at the very least, the purpose in our life should be that our presence makes our community and our society a little brighter than it was before us. And if each one of us learns to fulfill that purpose, then we will be able to accept each other as human beings and not identify people by the labels we have put upon ourselves. Today we identify people by labels. We have economic labels and religious labels and race labels and you name it and we have a label. And we identify people only by those labels. We've got to remove those labels. We've got to look at each other as human beings. And it's only when we are able to look at each other as human beings that we will un uh, appreciate our own humanity. So these are the four principles on which ideal relationships should be built. And if we build those relationships with each other and remove all the labels and all the restrictions that we have put upon ourselves, then we will be able to create peace in this world. There are many things about his philosophy and his life um, that we have not learned and we have um, ignored, largely because we find it very difficult to make the sacrifice. There's a very poignant statement that he made just a few days before his assassination when he told a journalist who asked him about, what do you think your, the future of your philosophy is going to be? And he said, well, the people will follow me in life, worship me in death, but not make my cause their cause. And this is, these are words that could be expressed by anybody. From all the people from Jesus and Buddha and Muhammad and and all of them to all the people that we worship today. <clears throat> all of them wanted us to change. They were teaching us to change our attitudes. But instead what we do is put them up on a pedestal and worship them. Because they were special people, they knew how to do things, but we are just ordinary people and we can't do it. We can't follow them. So we, we take that easy way out of it and we don't want to do what they wanted, uh, wanted us to do. So we just worship them and forget about it. We need to learn to follow them. We need to learn that the change they asked us was not just uh, 
you know, a, a, an absurd thing. It was something very important for us because we are going in the wrong direction with more and more violence consuming us. I want to end this story, uh, this talk today with a story that my grandfather used to be very fond of telling us of an ancient Indian king who once became very curious about the meaning of peace. And he invited all the intellectuals in his kingdom to come and explain the meaning of peace. And everybody came and did their best and nobody could really satisfy the king. And one day there was an another town who came on a visit and the king asked him the meaning of peace. And he said, the only person who can give you a satisfactory answer is an old sage who lives outside your kingdom. But he is so old that he cannot come to you. You will have to go to him and ask him this question. So the next day the king went to the sage and asked him the meaning of peace. And the sage went to the back of the house and came back with a grain of wheat and placed that grain of wheat on the king's palm and said, here is your answer. And of course the king didn't know what a grain of wheat had to do with peace and he didn't want to show his ignorance. So he quietly clutched that grain of wheat and went back to the palace and found a little gold box and placed that grain of wheat in the box. And every morning he would open the box to look for an answer and he couldn't find any answers. And then when this intellectual came back on a return visit a few days later, the king asked him to explain. And he said, well, it's very simple. He said, as long as you keep this grain of wheat in this box, nothing is going to happen. It will eventually rot and perish and that will be the end of the story. But if you had allowed this grain of wheat to interact with all the elements, if you had planted this grain outside in the soil, it would sprout and grow and very soon you could have a whole field of wheat. And that is the meaning of peace. If somebody has found peace and if they keep it locked up in their hearts for their own benefit, it will perish with them. But if they let it interact with all the elements, it would sprout and grow and very soon we could have a whole world of peacemakers. So I have come here this morning to give you the grain of wheat that I got from my grandfather. And I hope that you won't let it rot and perish but let it interact with all the elements so that all of us together can change this world and make it a better place for future generations. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, there's one in the back there, so up there, so let's do here first, and then we'll do in the back second. Um, hi, thank you so much for coming to Bakersfield. Uh, my name is Brittany. I'm a junior and a philosophy major here at CSUB, um, and it's like, it was totally like life transformational just hearing you speak. Um, my question is about the grain of wheat reference at the end. Um, I know how you said that a lot of our relationships are transactional and 
Um, because the philosophy of being nonviolent in a violent world, I wanted to know what your take was on movements that we have today, kind of like the Black Lives Matter movement. I know those have been questioned by a lot of um, critics, basically because it starts as peaceful protests and then there's so much um, violence that comes and they're and there actually like answers to super like acts of physical violence, but a lot of it's usually born from passive violence and reactions to it. Um, what would be your take on something like that? Well, yes, I have been following all of these movements and I've always been distressed because uh, they've been going into this uh, without properly understanding the philosophy. Um, you know, like Nipun said in his uh, talk, uh, you can use nonviolence uh, with love, which makes it more effective. Uh, if we show a lot of anger and aggression in our nonviolent action, then it's not effective at all. And I see in all of these movements, the thing that they emphasize is that they are not using violence, that is, they are not beating up anybody. But there's so much of anger and frustration that, um, you know, it, it can be just a violence. I'll give you an example. In uh, 1913, just before grandfather decided to leave South Africa and come back to India and take up the freedom struggle there, he launched a final campaign against uh, the uh, prejudices that existed at the time. And as he always did, he announced everything publicly. He knew, you know, he announced where he was going to do, what he was going to do, why he was going to do it. Everything was, you know, announced and made public. And that was very widely publicized. And then a few days later, the workers of the South African Railways uh, decided to go on a strike for better working conditions. And when grandfather saw this in the newspapers, he realized that this strike is going to uh, be, to affect the people, uh, you know, much more than um, his, uh, his campaign was going to. And so it was unfair of him to put additional pressure on the government by launching his own movement. So he withdrew his movement. He said, I'm going to wait until the strike is over and then I'll try this, you know, launch the campaign. Well, the leaders of the strikers came to him and said, look, strike is a legitimate nonviolent movement. Uh, we are not going to use violence. So why don't you join us? We'll fight the same enemies. And grandfather said, first of all, I want you to know that I don't have an enemy. I'm not fighting an enemy. I'm transforming a friend. That is a very important factor for us to understand. That when we are launching a movement against somebody, we are not fighting an enemy. We are trying to transform a friend. Now, how do you transform a friend? You can't go and catch them by the throat and say, you listen to me, I know the truth. Or but you do it through love and through uh, self-sacrifice and through understanding and transform their thinking. Well, the strikers went on strike. And as all strikers, you know, they had a lot of anger and frustration in them and they were expressing it in their slogans and they were shouting down with the government and we are going to get our demands and all that. So it was very easy for the police to infiltrate their ranks and cause an incident that would give them the justification to crush their movement. And that's what happened. Within four days, the strike was crushed, they, um, uh, and uh, they had to go back to work without gaining anything at all. Then grandfather launched his movement. 
and it went on for weeks until all the prisons were filled to capacity. And that is when General Smuts, uh, who was referred to by Nippon in his uh, invited grandfather to his office to come and discuss a settlement. And um, the, uh, Smuts at that time confessed to grandfather and he said, I could deal with the strikers because there was so much anger and, and uh, hate among them that I could create an incident and justify using violence against them. But he says, I don't know how to crush you because you are showing so much love and compassion towards us. And that is the key. When we launch a nonviolent struggle, if we do it with love and compassion, it's going to succeed. It may take longer, but it will succeed eventually. But if we have anger and frustration and we want to aggressively change people, that doesn't work. I hope it answers your question. Hi, uh, my name is Quinn. Thank you for speaking. Um, my question is in regards to the pencil story and the use of natural resources. Uh, how do issues of nonviolence, or how do like practices of nonviolence affect um, time-sensitive issues like climate change? Uh, kind of issues like what did you? Climate change. So like. Climate change. Yeah, we don't have that much time to deal with these issues and. Uh, the, the Earth's acting violently, you know, in response. Well, we waited and waited and waited until things started deteriorating so much that now we feel that we want to be in a hurry to change things. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not going to happen overnight. We have to change our habits, like I said, with passive violence. We are all contributing to it all the time, every day. I mean, if we look at our own lives, how much we waste every day. Every time we go to the bathroom, we use reams of paper to wipe our hands. Uh, we can't uh, carry uh, handkerchiefs in, in our pockets to use because that's too much of laundry and, and, and that kind of thing. So we use paper. And, and we destroy so many trees uh, in producing all those papers. So we are contributing in small ways all the time. And unless we change those habits of ours and, and um, stop wasting and destroying things, we, this kind of change that we want with climate change or anything, that's not going to come from the top down. It's got to come from the grassroots and, and we've got to uh, work at it at our level. Question here. बहुत मेहरबानी फॉर कमिंग आपका बात बहुत सुंदर है दैट्स माय ब्रोकन हिंदी टूटी पूटी हिंदी बोल सकते हैं अब माय क्वेश्चन इस हाउ डिड योर ग्रैंडफादर बिकम महात्मा वाज इट मोर ऑफ हिज नेचर और हिज नर्चर आई थिंक इट वाज बोथ and his nature and his virtue both uh, com combined to make him. Of course, he never believed that he was a Mahatma. Right up to the end, he said, I'm not a Mahatma. It's, I'm just an ordinary uh, person who, you know, somebody uh, once said that he was a, um, a, a saint masquerading as a politician. And uh, he said, no, it's the other way around. I'm a politician masquerading as a saint. <laughs> <laughs> we have a question, I saw a hand over here. It's, uh... Uh, I'm a 
I'm assuming that you're familiar with Jean Sharp, uh, mm -hmm. the author, uh, dealing with nonviolence and, and his methodologies. So uh, would those methodologies that he has written about and put out into uh, the ethos, is that um, something that you think that your grandfather would approve of or at least say that, yes, those are methods to use for nonviolence? Well, I don't know whether grandfather would have approved of it or not, but I personally didn't approve of it. Uh, largely because he had focused so much on um, nonviolence as a tool, uh, as a weapon of convenience. And he, I had this discussion with him and he believed very strongly that uh, there is no um, uh, you know, moral or or ethical component to the philosophy of nonviolence. It was just a purely a tool. If you found it convenient to use it at this time, use it. Otherwise, use non use violence. And like you, you know, the, uh, in her presentation, the president uh, said. Uh, that nonviolence is not a garment that you wear and when it's convenient and take off when it's not. Uh, you know, so I didn't agree with him when he said that uh, it's a tool. Nonviolence is a way of life. You be either believe in it or don't believe in it. There are no half measures. <laughs> so the young gentleman in the suit. Hi, my name is Samir. Uh, Nonviolence is the first truth is one of Gandhi's famous beliefs. How do you think this is present or relevant in the present day? How do I? How do you think nonviolence is the first truth is relevant in the present day? I think it's always relevant. I mean, if we, you know, nonviolence is based on positive components, respect, compassion, truth, understanding, love. These are all positive foundations on which nonviolence is based. So if we are asking the question today if nonviolence is relevant or not, we are basically asking the question is love and respect and understanding relevant today? And if we think that it's not relevant at all, then we are in a very bad state if love and respect are not relevant at all. So I think nonviolence will always be relevant as long as there is sanity in the world. But when insanity grips us, then God help us. So we have time for two more questions. We have one right here, the red shirt. Hi, uh, I'm Aaron Wan. I am a student here at CSUE. Uh, so my question is, we live in a really loud world right now where people don't listen to each other. It's very hard to communicate. Um, so how do you am amplify the positive nature, all the positivity, the peacefulness, when negativity is the very, uh, very distraction for almost everyone in the world? So how do you amplify that positivity and how can one person, one person really share that with everybody? Yes, one person has always made a big difference in everybody's life. Mahatma Gandhi was one person and today, you know, so he affected so many people's lives. Now this young girl who came from Sweden, Greta Thunberg, one person who took it upon herself and look how she has shaken up uh, all of us. So one person can make a difference if we make that difference in our own lives. If we start building better relationships with each other instead of just making friends on uh, Facebook or, uh, or Instagram and, you know, we need to make real friends and have re real relationships with people, uh, then we can make a difference. Thank you. And final question. We have a hand here. Hi, 
Um, Tammy Gordon, a uh, graduate student here. I'd like to ask you, do you agree with this, that encouraging and teaching diversity and cultural identity and propounding identitarianism actually leads more to divisiveness? Yes, when we emphasize our own, uh, you know, being we are exclusive or anything, then it does uh, do that. But uh, if we realize that we are part of a whole human family and everybody's culture is equally the same, uh, you know, in terms of religious practice, my grandfather used to say that religion is like climbing a mountain. We are ultimately all going up to the same peak. So why should it matter to anybody which side of the mountain we choose to climb up from? If we want to go up the Christian way or the Muslim way or the Hindu way or the Buddhist way, we are ultimately getting there to the same place. And if we accept that, then, you know, it will be much better. But if we create that exclusivity that I am, for instance, now people, you know, I am a vegan, you know, I am spatial, I am uh, not part of the mainstream. So you are creating another label for yourself. And when you create that label, you are breaking up your relationship with the mainstream society. And that's not a very healthy thing. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, Narendra Gandhi. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, so much for being here, spending your Saturday with us, and being part of this community. Um, please join us for some of our events coming up. And, Thank you again so much for, for, for being part of this. We really appreciate it. Have a great day. Thank you.